Okay, so maybe we should start this afternoon session again on the random first order transition theory. And it's our pleasure to have uh, one of the major protagonists, Peter Wallenis, who will discuss the theory of glasses the, the last 20 years mostly. Hello. Um, good, it sounds like it's working. Well, first, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the organizers and also Giorgio Parisi for uh, uh, inviting me and for having this great uh, uh, pleasure of having uh, one day out of this 40th anniversary celebration uh, be devoted to the 30th anniversary as counted by some uh, uh, of the random first order transition theory of glasses. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I, I, as much like Jean-Philippe, will give a somewhat historical talk. And I should say that I think one of the things that I've been learning in this whole field, and even more so at this conference, is that physics has a hard time with history. Um, and actually, I think the glass problem intrinsically has history dependence in the real uh, sense. And um, uh, on the other hand, we always think that we're trying to get towards platonic ideals that have to do with uh, the, uh, what would happen in the infinitude of time, but in reality, uh, we have to deal with the world as we see it. And of course, the glass phenomenon is a, is a transitory phenomenon. Mineralogists hardly know about glasses uh, because uh, the few glasses one has are, in fact, in geology, are very young rocks almost entirely. Uh, most rocks, after a while, become crystals. Um, and uh, mineral is even defined as a material that is crystalline. So, uh, so to some extent, you, you get the feeling that there's some kind of time limit on the glass problem. Well, of course, the other problem with physicists or physical scientists in general doing history is we don't know anything of the technology of history. My middle daughter is a medieval historian of Italy, and she sort of laughs about the idea of scientists talking about any historical questions um, uh, because we don't have usually enough distance uh, from the problems to form good, uh, good judgments, in her opinion. So I'm going to put that aside and therefore be rather personal about the history. And uh, as I said, the history of this problem, in, in my thinking, goes back quite a bit, uh, maybe more to about 40 years ago also. Uh, I had a student named Jim Skinner, who some of you may know. He's a good friend of Danny Fisher. Um, uh, he, uh, he was uh, my first uh, research student at Harvard. And uh, I started to work with him on the glass problem and expected him to get it solved in about three or four months in 1979, uh, but it turned out to take much longer. Um, and in fact, the work that I did with Jim had uh, only a little bit to do with what ends up being uh, the glass problem. So this is, though, the first paper on glasses where I mentioned Giorgio. Uh, and since this is at least partly a celebration of Giorgio, I, I w wanted to bring it up. I, I, of course, heard about Giorgio in my other life of doing Quantum Monte Carlo, and he had come to visit uh, Urbana. Uh, one of my postdocs was a particle physicist doing Quantum Monte Carlo on QCD, and uh, he told me that the new Fermi had arrived and that we have to go to hear his seminar. And uh, I think, uh, of course, we interpreted the new Fermi uh, as meaning uh, his uh, you know, brilliance and uh, ability to do many things as Fermi did. Uh, I think we now see 40 years later that he also was like Fermi in building a great school of, uh, of students. And uh, in that sense, I think that was an absolutely correct characterization of Parisi. Anyway, uh, around that time, uh, I was continuing to think about uh, glasses, and the, to me the most, uh, the most uh, fundamental problem was how could it be that an amorphous object could last for very, very long periods of time, certainly long on the time scale of vibrations. And um, I realized that maybe one idea is it's just like freezing, except that you're not freezing into a periodic structure, but into some other kind of structure. Why does everything have to be periodic? I had learned about chaos and all that years before in nonlinear mechanics. Why couldn't that be? So, uh, so this is the first, uh, well, it's actually the second paper that deals with this. Um, and uh, what we found was that uh, uh, if you took a, an amorphous, a specific amorphous structure, heated it up above a certain level or lowered its density, uh, it would uh, fall apart at some point. 
uh, there was a limit of stability that occurred at a density rather uh, uh, close to the densities people found in simulations of those early days, short simulations of, uh, of uh, what people were then calling a glass transition. And um, on the other hand, at that point, the free energy of this state was higher than the free energy of a liquid, and you had to go to a still higher density, near to the density of close packing uh, of Bernal to get this to be more stable than the real thing. And of course, this was so much like freezing that I knew it was wrong. Um, and so that's why we said something in the end, uh, uh, which, which uh, br brings in uh, at least my first reference to Giorgio. It says, uh, we should bear in mind that the analogous situation in spin glasses were the original mean field theories, by which I mean the original Edwards and Anderson mean field theories indicated the thermodynamic phase transitions. And then what I said was subsequent theories incorporate relaxation phenomena. Clearly I misunderstood. Uh, what replica symmetry breaking was about. I also misunderstood their result because uh, I said it's a smoothed out transition. It is actually smoother than was predicted by, by Edwards and Anderson. But I recognize this as a non-equilibrium phenomenon uh, and I had authority on my side. I said this non-equilibrium phenomenon may be responsible for interesting glass behaviors as Parisi suggests. I was also scandalized when I looked back at this paper recently to discover that reference 28 is to a paper of Mazard et al. So, um, uh, and actually Giorgio is a co-author, but it also shows again how he built this whole uh, school of people to really uh, solve these problems. And the behavior that they were talking about was the difference between field-cooled and non-zero uh, field-cooled spin glasses. Um, uh, well, so I said it's just like freezing, but you have an amorphous structure. Another kind of view of uh, glasses at time that also came from microscopic viewpoints was the mode coupling theory that Ted Kirkpatrick has been working on. And uh, we met in Aspen. I mean, we had met before then, but we spent a few weeks in Aspen. And I said, well, these two, we said these two theories look very similar. They have very similar ingredients. Their results are the same. Particles remain trapped around some aperiodic structure at a certain time. Um, must be the theories really are the same theory, but in different guises. And uh, so this is the first paper we wrote on the, uh, from that Aspen encounter. Um, and uh, it has many interesting ingredients. One was we could show the theories were equivalent, but only in very high dimension. Now that's sort of to be expected because mode coupling theory and density functional theory are both approximate theories. So it could only be that in some special limiting case could they be the same. Uh, and uh, even then, they were not quite exactly the same in high dimension, but they were very close. They both agreed that the transition was discontinuous in some fashion. Um, so that didn't solve anything, except in the meantime, uh, Gross, Cantor, and Sampolinsky had solved the pot spin glass uh, that we heard about, and they had this very strange phenomenon of having a discontinuous phase transition, but nevertheless one that had uh, no latent heat, for example, which is true of glasses. Um, and uh, so we suggested in this paper that the discontinuous nature of the transition points to a close connection with Potts glasses rather than with Ising spin glasses. Um, now, uh, this theory then had to be uh, uh, made even, a, 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 how do you make that connection? They were, they were, that, that's just saying their behavior is the same. Um, could this be made uh, more precise or, uh, and one, one approach to this was what Ted and uh, Dave did, which was they tried to use the mode coupling theory on the P-spin model and showed that they got uh, the same results um, for that as for ordinary uh, glass transitions. They also found weirdly that there were two transitions, but that fit nicely with the picture of Singh Sosa Wallace that there's one transition of getting stability and another transition of thermodynamic uh, uh, stability. By the way, that first transition really wasn't noticed in the calculations of Gross, Cantor, and Sapolinsky because you have to divide by zero. And you know, David Gross is a little bit too professional to divide by zero without, without mentioning it. Um, but Ted was a little more bold. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so what was going on here? Well, of course, again, knowing the answer, that's the great thing about physics. We know that we have a back of the book, actual experiments. We know that the experiments tell us there's a problem, actual problem with entropy, uh, and that the temperature at which things seem to slow down uh, forever was related to the vanishing of entropy. 
And in this model, sorry, in this model, one could go ahead and calculate the entropy from the, of, the, of the thalus anderson palmer solutions of the Potts glass and find that actually this transition occurred through an entropy crisis, just like Kautzmann uh, uh, suggested might portend uh, in real systems. Well, also, uh, I wanted to calculate rates. And the mean field theory doesn't tell you anything about rates, but if you have a first order like transition, you immediately say, yes, there's got to be activated events. You've got to form droplets. And uh, so this is why real RFOT theory is a kind of uh, hybrid of the uh, a replica picture and the droplet picture that we've heard as being fighting against each other. Well, I would say they actually cooperate. Uh, and the difference is, are your droplets simple objects or are they complex objects? Um, anyway, so in this paper, we, d we dealt with the problem of droplets. Um, and uh, we said that, uh, of course, they must be complex droplets because there's non-exponential relaxations in glasses. That must point to there being many different states. Um, and uh, then we suggested to do the dynamic analysis, we do something uh, like uh, uh, nucleation theory um, and, uh, and said, well, maybe you could do this with instanton techniques. Actually, this cites a paper by Nicholas Surlas and Parisi. Uh, but we also knew that was too hard a theory to do, so we made a, a, a simplification of theory that gave a result like this. Which, by the way, uh, in this theory, you have the configurational entropy of the solutions. That's what's driving the transitions from one state to many. Um, it contains a surface energy uh, term. Those things have to balance each other. And this is more or less what you might call the, the traditional nucleation theory result. This would give the length exponent of uh, d minus 1 for, uh, for the energy that comes from the surfaces. And um, you see, by the way, if you take d literally up to infinity, this says things are frozen. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we uh, said that someday someone will have to figure out instanton techniques for random systems in detail. I think that's still on the agenda. A few years uh, uh, later, we, uh, uh, I uh, uh, met up with uh, Ted again at a conference I organized on glasses at ITP. It was a complete failure as a conference because high TC was discovered that year and everyone started to work on high TC. Um, uh, but uh, Ted and I continued to work. And oh, no, actually, I should go back to this one here. Um, and, uh, and, and this result was reported. I reported about this there. Uh, it was interesting because we had an audience about this size at the very end. I think Ted had gone. He wasn't there at the meeting. And at the end, they had a vote on is there a growing correlation length involved in the glass transition of the whole entire uh, group. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I raised my hand. Uh, and Dan Stein raised his hand. Uh, so there were only two out of 100 who thought that there was something like a growing correlation length. Uh, and Danny was there, by the way. He did not raise his hand. Okay. As you might expect, I don't think he'll raise his hand today either. Um, well, as I went off the second half of my sabbatical to Japan, I continued to play with this because there seemed to be multiple lengths in this problem. The length of the interface, how big, thick an interface was, how big the droplets were. These, this seems strange. Uh, especially because, as you can see, there was almost no evidence that there were growing lengths anyway at that point, because there was a vote was, is there one growing length, not are there two, are there three? Well, if you believe that there's only one growing length, that there is one, but there's only one, then you get that there's a condition of hyperscaling in the theory. And when you take the condition for hyperscaling and you say, I know that the heat capacity has a discontinuity, that corresponds to a critical exponent for heat capacity of zero, then you get a, a, a length exponent of 2 over d. So the assumption of one length hyperscaling gives you that result for nu. And a second thing was miraculously the fogel fulcher law appeared out of the dust, the exact fogel fulcher fulcher law, which we've seen questioned this morning, but that actually in experimental data fits extremely well, definitely fits better than the law of the square. Um, and, uh, and I've got to say, this was a unique experience uh, for me because uh, uh, I remember deriving this result in this way at my desk in Japan, and I was like 
just thrilled. I still remember now, this is amazing that this can come out. Uh, it's those kind of like weird coincidences that I think make it fun in theoretical uh, science. Um, and of course, it convinces you that you're doing the right thing. Um, now, I was so convinced that I said nothing more about glasses for about 10 years. Um, uh, and, uh, and I was getting irritated, however. People who I really admired, like Phil Anderson, wrote papers like, it would be really great if someone would solve the glass problem. And I said, well, yeah, that was done five years ago. Um, what, and I said, what's the problem here? And I said, well, the problem is that people want to calculate exponents. They love exponents. But we can't get very close to the transition to get exponents. So how can we ever convince anyone based on exponents? Well, I said, the great thing is the theory lets you calculate numbers from a microscopic theory, or at least try to. Now, other theories of glasses at that time didn't even let you try to start to calculate numbers in the activated regime. Mode coupling theory calculates the transition point, but it doesn't tell you how to calculate the activated behavior. And I said, well, here it's straightforward uh, to at least try to make an estimate. And uh, the estimate uh, is, is clearly a complicated calculation. You want to find instantons for the density functional of one guy living with respect to the other. That's very much like what we heard this morning from uh, uh, Giulio Baroli, something that would be now called a calculation of the instantons of the Franz Parisi potential. And I tried to convince Xiaoyu Xia to do this calculation. It was very hard to convince him. So I said, look, the reason a student can't do this is he's not motivated. He thinks it's going to be so hard, and he's right, it's going to be so hard. Uh, but let me get an approximate answer. So the approximate answer was obtained in the following way. You say that uh, 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 you're localized strictly in one region, and that the interface uh, to the delocalized, or sorry, you're delocalized in one region, the interface to the surrounding material is sharp. Of course, it's not sharp. That's why you get this weird exponent, 2 over d. But if you know what the, if, if, if that were literally true, then you're able to calculate the surface tension by a simple argument saying that the surface tension is the same force that's finally giving you the vanishing of the entropy. It's, of course, an interaction term, but it must be then that that interaction term is what's necessary to finally overcome the entropy at the, uh, at the standard uh, glass transition itself, at the, uh, sorry, at the Kautzmann transition itself. Weirdly, that turns out to depend, since it's an entropy, it depends logarithmically on how much things are confined. And we know that things are confined only about tenth of a particle spacing in their vibrations. There's a thing called the Lindemann criterion. If you try to vibrate bigger than that, the geometry of three-dimensional space makes it very hard for you to stay stable. Um, and uh, then you get an actual number for this surface tension. It's a very simple number. Also, it depends logarithmically on something that's thought to be almost the same for everything. So a logarithm of a number that doesn't change much is a number that doesn't change much at all. OK. So this means that, in fact, the differences from one substance to another are not primarily contained in this surface energy, but are contained in how the entropy varies. Um, that also means, since the uh, uh, time scale for escape depends roughly is uh, equal to the, 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 the surface energy cost uh, times a half, um, that in fact the size region that gets turned over is a function universally of the uh, relaxation time measured in some molecular time scale. So according to this theory, you get uh, uh, this as the, as the length. The lengths turn out to be about of order five. Uh, particle spacings when the particles are uh, uh, w at, at the laboratory glass transition at, uh, you know, say, 100 uh, an hour or so relaxation time. Um, interestingly, Adam Gibbs shows you have very, very tiny little things. When people say Adam Gibbs tells you that you've got growing regions, he used those words. But if you, if you put the numbers into his theory, the size regions are about two particles. Uh, at, at that point. Now, do you want to do a microscopic theory of things that are eight? We're already questioning whether you should do something for something that's five by five by five, but I think you'd have even more problems if you did two by two by two, and we ask you to extrapolate. Okay, um, so what are the consequences of that, that entropy controls everything? Well, first of all, most of, half of these were already known. 
uh, experimentally, but they were peculiar. One was, of course, the thing we've heard many times, that the temperature at which the entropy should vanish, the, the configurational entropy should vanish, should correlate with the temperature at which, in the fogel fulcher law, the rate should go to zero. Well, here's 50 substances, not calculated by me, not culled from the literature, just taken by Austin Angel. Now, maybe he screwed around with things. But, uh, but this is a thermodynamic measurement here. This is a kinetic measurement here. And you can see that the data fall very on that line. That's not a fit. That's the line of slope one. Now, uh, the, uh, the other thing that's, of course, weird about glasses is some glasses seem to be very Arrhenius-like. Some seem to differ tremendously from Arrhenius. So that, for example, here, the activation energy is several electron volts. So you say, how do I get electron volts out of o terphenyl? That's one of the clues that you've got to be doing something collective. Um, Probably. Well, this theory actually says that this slope depends on how rapidly entropy changes, because entropy is the driving force. How much it changes with temperature, that's the heat capacity. That's measured for lots and lots of substances. And that tells us that the slope here, this activation barrier um, uh, in uh, units of the actual glass transition temperature, uh, should depend on the heat capacity. Uh, difference of uh, the material when it changes from a liquid into a glass. As I said, that's been measured for many things. Theory predicts that this number should be 34.7. That has to do with the value of that surface energy coefficient. Uh, the heat capacity per mole, but of course a mole of molecules is not a mole of movable objects, so you convert that back to mole of movable objects by comparing it to the entropy of fusion. So. This is the theoretical value of M. This is the measured value of M. That's the line of slope one. OK. I would say that you have to be a very strange person to say that this is not convincing, that there's something like entropy driving the transition. You can argue there's something else going on, maybe to give you some deviations here. There's a few points that are really odd, but if you're a chemist, you, these don't bother you much. Decalin here. Uh, is a material that when it melts, it still rotates in the, on the molten phase. Uh, similarly, selenium, when it's undergoing the transition to becoming an amorphous material, is also polymerizing. So, uh, so in general, this is a really quite strong uh, correlation. Now, of course, this length being fixed is something to go after. And it's very hard, though. This is a size range which is not easy to measure. Uh, I'd ask one of my colleagues at Illinois to try to do experiments where you would put liquids inside of little uh, uh, small uh, 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 vesicles, the Jerry Jonas, and he started to show that there were effects, um, but it really was very hard to um, measure uh, the glass transition in these confined liquids. Uh, but we had already made suggestions in this paper, the scaling paper that I mentioned with Ted and Dave, we said, well, one possibility is the use of a scanning tunneling microscope or various tribological experiments, that is rubbing one piece of material against another. There's, that's what we now call the atomic force microscope. And friction in ultra-thin films where these effects may be seen at the correlation length scale. Uh, well, that was a suggestion like many that are made in this paper that took a long time to be taken up. It was taken up by my colleague Martin Grubely about 20 years later who uh, had acquired a scanning tunneling microscope. And he said, I got this big microscope. Is there anything interesting I could do with it? Uh, and I said, yeah, why don't you measure this, uh, take, take a sample of metallic glass, measure uh, the, what the surface looks like, measure what size clusters move around. And uh, I'll, I can show you a movie of that, but I don't have the time. But if it, it'll be on the website uh, when we do this. And then this shows you the atomic size of the clusters, which he's able to find in one metallic glass. And you can see there's somewhere in this range around between four and six. Uh, there's something a little perhaps odd going on with zirconium, I don't know. So uh, if you can believe your eyes, or at least the scanning tunneling microscope, ordinary liquids at the size, range, at the temperature scale of the glass transition involve objects of the size of 120 or so particles uh, moving uh, in a collective fashion. Um, and that's just observation. Um, 
There are, of course, other ways to find the correlation length and that are very exciting and let you do a larger variety of materials. Uh, again, uh, this is something that Bouchot and uh, uh, Baroli and uh, I think Ludovic uh, were involved in and show again this size around five is what's going on at real glasses. Okay, now I said that there's this diversity of states and uh, the theory that I described here so far is almost just exactly like nucleation. Uh, where does the diversity of states come in? Well, we said that it comes in at the non-exponential relaxation of quantities. These usually follow what's called a stretched exponential law. And the stretched exponential relaxation has been measured for lots and lots of things. It's difficult to measure because uh, uh, it really involves curve fitting and so on. Uh, but it's been measured for many of them. The, the theory says that, that this should be computed by, um, that this depends on the fluctuations of entropy of individual sites. The fluctuations of entropy are back to the heat capacity. The heat capacity is also related back to that, that uh, 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 fragility index, that M value. Here it's written in a different way of D. And you get a nice prediction from that. This theory can actually be done with replicas, was done by Maxim Zero and Schmali, and then you would get this answer. Well, it's right, as, it become, as the material becomes uh, less fragile, beta goes closer to one, but it's off. What's the origin of this? The origin of this is that uh, the distribution of uh, uh, deep traps is too broad. It's too broad because if all of the regions around you have reconfigured, you have no way of knowing you're supposed to be pinned where you were before. Your surface energy has gone down. And so this is actually a facilitation effect, which gives uh, this, if you take that into account, that gives you this curve, which you can see goes through the data quite well. Uh, one of the issues, which I guess since I have only a few minutes, is you know, the theory here is what are the shape of these objects? Uh, it turns out that, of course, if the surface tension gets lower and lower, then these objects can become less and less compact. And uh, in fact, one can make an argument for where the mode coupling transition should be uh, on the basis of the idea that things are basically percolation cluster-likes uh, objects. Uh, by the way, that's a theory uh, based on the work of Michael Fisher um, and, uh, uh, and was an example of using percolation ideas to get an estimate of a transition in a, in a real system. Uh, so the disconnect between percolation and phase transition is not perhaps as profound as uh, one might hope. Um, in fact, the very stringy things that occur are secondary relaxations. Uh, and uh, one sees then if you have a stringy object, it fluctuates more relative to its surface energy. And that's why, in fact, there's always a, there is a trail of very high, uh, uh, very high energy states that have, therefore, low activation barriers that give rise to the so-called secondary relaxations. Both of these were uh, work done with Jake Stevenson. The other work also involved Jörg Schmalian. Now, everything was about liquids, but I said I'd talk about the theory of glasses. Um, the glass is, at least initially, uh, an arrested liquid. You've gotten to a place where you've fallen out of equilibrium. You can't grow these clusters any bigger, but you can still see a few of them move around a bit. And that gives a very slow relaxation in the system. That slow relaxation near the transition is itself still very uh, Arrhenius-like, and you can measure the ratio of the parent activation energy in the glass to what it was in the liquid. This is a number called X. And uh, in this paper with Vas Lubchenko, we introduced this idea very similar to the, which we, which we call the library construction, to the point to set correlation that we heard about earlier. And in this theory, then, what you find is the size of these regions can't change anymore, uh, and the driving force remains whatever it was, um, and because of that, it's really, um, uh, you, you no longer keep going deeper and deeper in the landscape as you cool, and that's why this number x is smaller than one. By the way, this would give you waiting time dependence. How do you figure out what really goes on in real glasses then? They're not equilibrium systems. They're not even quite frozen systems. They continue to age. Well, you actually have to throw back the, the activated events into a full dynamical theory. And I've run out of time, but that full dynamical theory has a large number of interesting uh, consequences, one of which is if you do experiments of heating things up rather than cooling them down, 
then these regions expand like a flame rather than uh, just sort of sitting there. So this rejuvenation experiment involves uh, front propagation, and that's something that's also been seen when ultra-stable glasses were made by Ettinger. This theory predicts very well the speed of that front propagation. Also, we've heard about stress and elasticity quite a lot here. Uh, stress uh, is another way of changing the energy of the region that needs to nucleate. If, you, if it can nucleate to a region that has no stress, then that energy gets given up. That makes it easier to make this transition. And uh, one can calculate from that, when would the barrier go to zero? And that tells you about the strength of glasses. So I guess I'll end there, but to say that uh, this theory in which you put the instantons back into mode coupling theory uh, is a very rich uh, kind of theory. Uh, it's also a very unrigorous theory, but I would say it's only as unrigorous as many things done in quantum chromodynamics where instantons have never fully been put into a perturbative analysis of what goes on. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, I, so I think there's a, a plenty of work done need to be done to make that a sort of rigorous analysis of things. But at this point, it explains many, many phenomena. I'll just zap through there. Just to remind you, this is a series of actual experimental observations in the laboratory that have been uh, uh, studied by this kind of theory. This tends to tell you the year in which I studied, how well the theory agrees with experiment, and, uh, it, uh, and I just want to emphasize that the RFOT theory makes many more predictions than you get a focal Fulcher law. It makes many other predictions, which most of which have been confirmed. There are very few that I've, I don't, I don't think there's any very clear example of something that really uh, uh, completely violates the, the scheme uh, based on RFOT. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We have time for just a few questions. You know, that's the problem of having such a complete talk. Yeah, well, everybody's so convinced. That that's you know, good. That's good. Well, I see that some of my critics didn't come, so that explains <laughs> that. Uh, uh, so, but I'll let you. You're yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm allowed. Yes. <laughs> well, it, you know, some of this is, is uh, again, t to be the devil's advocate, is, is some of this is, is phenomenology and, and some of the measures, you know, when we talk about beta, the exponent, which is the stretching, or m, which is the, uh, the fragility, we know that they can vary quite a lot when you, when you do experiments or one from one probe to another. I mean, anybody who's seen uh, and worked with experimentalists know that this, this is not a very strict uh, fit. Now, other theories, on the other hand, you know, gave also predictions. You know, I, I won't mention mine, but, but I will mention facilitation, you know, it's been around for a while and is making lots of predictions. It's, I mean, fitting data is, is not enough, we know, to convince people that we have a theory of the glass transition. So, may I answer you? you? May I answer you? No, may I, I answer you? Just, just no, let me answer you. I, I because you've said something that's wrong. Okay. You well, said that this is fitting data. You're absolutely right about fitting data. It can't convince people. That's why I want to emphasize those are not fits. The prediction that T0 equals TK, that's not a fit. The prediction that M has that value, that's not a fit. I didn't screw around with any of the numbers in there. Now, you could blame no, someone else for yeah, screwing right, around, right, perhaps. What, but I think they didn't. No, but, but the, uh, the fits, T0 is a fit. M is a fit, beta yeah, is a fit. Yeah, but they're in completely Everything independent fit. fits. Yeah, but you, you somebody can somebody that. makes a measurement in this laboratory and you no. fit it one way. Another person measures an entirely different thing over there. How do they collude, to use the word in America, uh, to to make sure these two numbers agree? Their 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 independence is what's important. As to beta, I agree with you on beta. Beta is a fitted number. It's, an, it's a very hard one. There's all kinds of questions about that how do you fit beta. Quite a lot. People do slightly different ways. Do you include the secondary relaxation? Do you not, et cetera? Yes, that's, they're, they're, that's not the kind of line that you get in, uh, say, ch testing quantum electrodynamics. I know. Uh, so, just... so I would just say that the error is comparable to what you have. And again, nothing was fit. There's no fitting parameter in this result. This result is just what comes out of the theory. 
But remember, that other theories also fit the data. No, other th that's where you're wrong. I know of no theory, including yours, that, that takes, that has, that has, that, that, that does not introduce other uh, uh, adjustable constants. You're so I agree that there are ways, that's what I call fitting. When, you, when your theory you, you is just that, constants, then, then, you're, then you can fit, and I agree. There are many theories, facilitation, blah, blah, blah. You can even do things like facilitation. You can cut off your, 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 um, your, your parabola if, and, and well, fit the data with that. I'm sorry. In one case, you have, a, you have a theory that without adjustment gives agreement with experiment no, and makes sense. In other cases, you have since, no since calculation. I'm a, since I'm a chairman, I, I didn't want actually to, to argue. No, no, but I no, no, you did want. I asked no, you to I just argue. wanted to ask what kind, what would you think in terms of, you know, people are here doing the, the theory, working still on, on the RFOT theory, what do you think will, will be a most definite uh, theoretical proof that, that the, the, the theory is, you know, asymptotically valid or is doing something? Do, do I think asymptotically any, valid any, any is, a, is a theological the question. That, that, that the asymptotic validity I have m make no claims for. Okay. Uh, so uh, and in fact, I, uh, if you let me go ahead, I would say it was brought up about Kautzman. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that has come out of the theory that I didn't, uh, we didn't even plan to talk about was about what happens with crystallization. And uh, one of the things which it turns out I had forgotten was predicted in the 1989 paper was that the correlation length for, um, for the glassy rearrangement goes uh, larger as you cool, whereas the correlation length for nucleating the crystalline solid shrinks. They cross at some point. When they cross, you get a new mechanism of, of, of crystal nucleation, where crystal nucleation is faster than, um, than, than the alpha relaxation. So in that regime, it's metaphysics uh, to discuss the alpha relaxation. So asymptotically, you're protected from getting there by the reality of crystallization. And by the way, that has an, a, an observa a prediction about something you can observe. That's never been observed because you have to go to a very low uh, entropy to see that, but what it says is that if you actually already have a surface that's crystalline, that there's a regime, and that's the normal regime, where the rate of progression of the crystal front depends on the diffusion coefficient in the material and is very high, sorry, it's very low. But you cool lower, and when you cool lower, you get to the point where it's easier to directly nucleate on the surface and now you get a much faster uh, crystal growth. So that's actually been observed and is one of the consequences of theory. So, so there are many consequences of the theory that have to do with uh, 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 you know, more elaborate situations. The theory, uh, as I said, involves putting, and I, uh, putting uh, the dynamics of activated events into a full dynamical construction. And there are phenomena that depend on that. One was the shear bands, which I didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, and, uh, and certainly there's also interesting phenomena that are being discussed now in terms of the Gardner transition that are also uh, related to that. So I would say the, the, those problems, some of which people are already working on, are very fruitful things to continue to work on. Okay, thank okay. you for this you. Uh, answer. So the next